welcome to The World This Week with Tanya Francis, a look back at some of the biggest global news stories for an international city, brought to you by the London Live News team. Tonight, tension between China and Taiwan, with the Defence Minister saying it's the worst it's been in 40 years, as the Chinese sent over 150 military warplanes into Taiwanese defence zones. Catastrophic flooding in Oman and Iran as cyclone Shaheen ripped through the region. It's believed to have reached wind speeds of 150 kilometers per hour and whipped up waves over 10 meters high. And hoping to attract over 25 million visitors before next April, Dubai launched a six months long exhibition with the hopes to drive tourism after the pandemic. They kicked it off with uh, this four story high water feature that gives you the sense that you're being engulfed by a waterfall. That's all on the way before 7.30, but first tonight to Taiwan. And the country's defence minister has said the tensions with China are the worst they've been in the last 40 years. It comes after China sent around 150 military warplanes into Taiwan air defence zones for four days, with Taiwanese leaders saying they'll do whatever it takes to defend its democracy and independence. Well, a bit of history on how we've got to today. They were divided during a civil war in the 1940s, but the Chinese government see Taiwan as a breakaway province that will eventually be a part of the country again. Unification has historically been a goal of the Chinese leader, Xi Jinping, who has not ruled taking Taiwan by force. However, Taiwan considers itself a sovereign state, which holds democratic elections, has freedom of speech, its own military and currency. Alexander Wang, professor of Tamkang University, has been speaking about the growing tension. We do whatever we can. We try to be innovative, we try to be creative, we try to work extremely hard to make sure that um, the external environment uh, will allow Taiwan to continue to exist and survive and develop. Of course, any advancement or improvement of Taiwan's foreign relations would definitely antagonize Beijing for sure. Uh, and it is up to uh, the wisdom of Taiwan leaders to gauge, uh, to consider, you know, uh, how, to, how they should prioritize events uh, and activities that can work best for Taiwan's uh, interests. Well, Professor Wang there, he went on to say that uh, he believes China's military operation isn't in preparation for war, but more a protest against the US and other allied forces putting pressure on China and offering support to Taiwan. Now, globally, in what has been a groundbreaking year for vaccinations, the world's first malaria vaccine was approved on Wednesday in a historic go-ahead from the World Health Organization. Children across Africa will be offered the jab in an attempt to control the deadly disease, which kills around 260,000 African children every year. It's already been given to around 800,000 children across Ghana, Kenya and Malawi as part of an ongoing pilot program. Health officials have said the vaccine developed by the pharmaceutical giant GlaxoSmithKline could save many African children from dying from the parasitic disease. Using this vaccine in addition to existing tools to prevent malaria could save tens of thousands of young lives each year. Malaria has been with us for millennia and the dream of a malaria vaccine has been a long-held but unattainable dream. Today, the RTSS malaria vaccine, more than 30 years in the making, changes the course of public health history. We still have a very long road to travel, but this is a long stride down that road. This vaccine is a gift to the world. Well, a groundbreaking week indeed for vaccines. Now to Pakistan, where a powerful earthquake has rumbled through the southwest of the country. It happened early on Thursday morning. At least 20 people died and hundreds more were injured, with the death toll expected to rise as rescue workers make their way through the rubble. Local media sources reported that military doctors and paramedics were involved. They say it was a 5.9 magnitude quake. But I would say this was more than this. Lots of humans lost and damaged to property. The main mosque of the town also damaged badly.
Now, most homes in the Hanai area where the earthquake happened are made of mud and stone, many of which collapsed. And as we can see from this footage, a large number of other buildings have also been damaged. The 5.9 magnitude earthquake struck at 3 a.m. in the morning, um, as most people in the area were asleep. However, that particular part of Pakistan has many coal mines. It was confirmed that at least one of those collapsed, with worries the death toll could rise as many miners were already at work when the earthquake hit. Everyone, including women and children, were running here and there. We were scared. We didn't know what to do. Later, ambulances arrived and took injured to hospital. On to sport now for a showdown in Las Vegas. Tyson Fury and Deontay Wilder fight for the third time in another high-profile heavyweight title fight. But the question on many people's lips is who's going to win? With little to go by performance-wise, as both have had nearly two years out of the ring. Well, let's take a look at a bit of the history. The last time they faced each other was in February 2020, when Fury became the world champion. But... Will that be the case this time? The pair fought in December 2018 first, with judges scoring the fight as a split draw, many disputing whether Fury could win a rematch. But in 2020, he pushed the action throughout, causing Wilder to throw in the towel. The rivalry was supposed to conclude last July, but had to be cancelled due to the coronavirus pandemic. After a near deal to take on Anthony Joshua and a bout of COVID-19 for Fury, the autumn date was finally confirmed. Now let's go to predictions now. The one-sided nature of the second fight means that few were tipping Wilder to take on the title. The American made a series of bizarre and unfounded excuses for the first defeat of his professional career. From the weight of his elaborate ring walk costume draining his legs to Fury tampering with his own gloves. Guys, please take a seat. Let's start the news conference. He's been posting videos of gruelling training regimes and seems motivated to prove doubters wrong. Fury is an odd-on favourite to successfully defend his word title. However, it has only been three months since Fury tested positive for COVID-19. Now, there's no suggestion that he struggled with the virus, but no one outside his inner circle would be privy to such information anyway. Well, the blockbuster heavyweight clash takes place in Las Vegas tonight. Now to the UK and uh, proof that sometimes slow and steady wins the race. This week, three giant Galapagos tortoises who call London their home have embarked on a trek across the zoo to move to a new dedicated area ahead of an exhibition in their honour. Well, Dr Chris Michaels has said that Dolly, Polly and Priscilla did an excellent job at moving house. So it's a relatively short distance, 200 metres between the old giant tortoise house and the current building. And so we thought that it would be perfect if the tortoises could walk all the way from their old house to their new house, because that would be the best way to settle them in. So the tortoises are trained, they're station trained, which means that they, they are trained to walk in front of a cone and stand by it. Um, and they have a different coloured cone, one for each tortoise, and then they get a reward. So we did short walks of a few meters at a time, placing the cone, waiting for them to approach it, giving them some food and then repeating. So the cones worked really well for about half of the journey, but at that point the tortoises started to get a little bit tired and we had to abandon the cones and just go to pure bribery um, and give them tasty treats to get them over the line for the second half of the journey. Well, there you have it. So to cover that 200 metre distance, it took the tortoises about an hour to an hour and a half each. Um, but they are settling in well now and adapting to their new pad, which is climate controlled and equipped with rain and fog systems so that they can feel like they are at home in the Galapagos. Well, let's bring you this before the break. A six month long exhibition aimed at driving tourism and business in Dubai has got underway, having been delayed by the pandemic. The Dubai Expo 2020 is a world fair hoping to attract 25 million visitors before next April with tech innovation and sustainability at its heart. Well, this week saw one of the blockbuster experiences unveiled, a four-storey high water feature that gives audiences a sense of being engulfed by a waterfall. It's been created by the US firm WET. We're combining here the creativity of what man can do, humankind, at our best, with the power and the richness of nature. It's bringing joy to people. They're seeing it almost as nature, but carved into a sculpture by man. And the music that you hear for this piece was composed especially for this by Ramin Javadi, the composer of Game of Thrones and Westworld and so many of our favorite motion pictures. 
Following the theme of sustainability, one of the Expo 2020's main themes, organisers say the installation is designed to be eco-friendly, wasting no water aside from what evaporates during the spectacle. You stand there, you can, it feels like the water is falling to you, but then it just magically disappears into your feet. You don't feel even the water. I don't know what to say anymore. It's super impressive with all the music, 360 surround music. It's magical. Have a look at this, guys. <laughs> at, at Expo 2020. And this is just amazing. It's called Surreal and there's water coming from everywhere. It's absolutely magical. It's got a soft spray on your face. It's cool. It's got light flashing everywhere. And the music is unbelievable. One of the best things I've seen here on my second time here. Come in the day and the night, you'll not be disappointed. It's fabulous. <laughs> Well, that rather beautiful installation is the first of many coming to the Dubai Expo 2020. Well, the world this week continues after the break. We'll be back with news uh, from the United States as a federal judge temporarily blocks a new law which saw a near total ban on abortions in Texas. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're watching The World This Week from the London Live News team. A review of the main international stories that have broken over the last seven days. Still to come before 7.30. Almost six glaciers have vanished since 1980s as far as satellite data analysis is uh, concerned. So out of them, four glaciers have disappeared after 2000s. Concerns in the Himalayas as researchers express their worries over the rate at which the glaciers are melting. But first, back to the USA and the state of Texas. A federal judge has temporarily blocked a new law that bans women from terminating a pregnancy. It's the most restrictive abortion law in the US, and since September, when it got passed, has banned most abortions. Well, let's take a look at the moment Merrick Garland, the US Attorney General, made the announcement. Last week, after the Supreme Court allowed Texas Senate Bill 8 to take effect, I said that the Justice Department was evaluating all options to protect the constitutional rights of women and other persons. Today, after a careful assessment of the facts and the law, the Justice Department has filed a lawsuit against the state of Texas. Our position is set out in detail in our complaint. Well, this is the first legal setback the law has faced. It was previously met with many early challenges. Thousands of abortion rights supporters were out on the streets of Texas protesting when it originally became law in September. They were joined by demonstrators across the world calling for the protection of abortion rights. Well, the suspended law is known as Senate Bill 8 and was signed by the Republican governor of the state, Greg Abbott, back in May. It means a woman is not able to have an abortion once a heartbeat is detected, which is usually around the six-week mark. Well, let's remind ourselves of the moment which the law was passed. Our creators endowed us with the right to life, and yet millions of children lose their right to life every year because of abortion. In Texas, we work to save those lives. And that's exactly what the Texas legislature did this session. They work together on a bipartisan basis to pass a bill that I'm about to sign that ensures that the life of every unborn child who has a heartbeat will be saved from the ravages of abortion. Well, the lawsuit against that was uh, filed by the Biden administration, who has said that the restrictions do not obey by the rules of the Constitution. With Planned Parenthood saying the number of patients at its clinic in Texas fell by nearly 80 percent in the two weeks after the law was passed. But the fight over Texas abortion law is far from over. State officials filed for a notice of appeal immediately, which could lead to further court battles. But some abortion clinics have reopened despite fears the ban may only be short-lived. Now, to this story coming out of the UK. The High Court has found the Prime Minister of the United Arab Emirates, Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, authorised for his ex-wife's phone to be hacked. It happened while the couple were in court in London deciding the welfare of their two children. 
The court ruled that Sheikh Mohammed expressed or implied authority for the phone of his sixth wife, Princess Haya bint Hussein of Jordan, to be hacked during their divorce custody case, along with that of her solicitors. The software believed to have been used is called Pegasus and can track a person's location, read their texts and emails and listen to phone calls as well as record them. Well, Princess Haya has responded after the discovery and said that it's made her feel hunted and haunted. Well, this news comes after a court found he kidnapped and forcibly sent his daughters, Sheikha Latifa and Sheikha Shamza, back to Dubai. It's been reported that Sheikh Mohammed has denied any acknowledgement of the hacking. To Amman and Iran now, where Cyclone Shaheen caused catastrophic flooding this week, with the death toll of around 15 people. These shocking images show the extent of the damage as a deadly storm ripped through the region. The cyclone caused large masses of land to collapse and flooded streets, submerging buildings and cars. Well, it's believed to have reached wind speeds of 150 kilometers per hour and uh, whipped up waves of over 10 meters high. Well, Iranian state television reported that rescuers had found the body of one of of five fishermen who went missing off the coast of Pasabanda, a fishing village near Iran's border with Pakistan. This morning we found one dead body out of the five missing fishermen. The bodies of the four others have not been found because of the high tide. Rescue workers are still out there and when the tide is out, they will continue their search using floodlights and other equipment to find the four others. Rescue workers are still out there and when the tide is out, they will continue their search using floodlights and other equipment to find the other four. Mother Nature in full force across Iran and Oman this week. To Kashmir now, and researchers from a university in the Indian-controlled part of the state have raised concerns at the rate at which glaciers in the Himalayan mountains have begun to melt. Well, according to experts, the vast mass of ice you can see here has receded more than 50 metres in the last three years alone. It's just one of thousands of glaciers in the area that has seen rapid change because of a warming climate. So we have almost 14,000 glaciers in, in, the, in the Jammu and Kashmir region. And for example, in Kashmir Valley, which is a small uh, basin feeding into the larger upper Indus Basin. So almost six glaciers have vanished since 1980s as far as satellite data analysis is uh, concerned. So out of them, four glaciers have disappeared after 2000s. So, and mostly it is because of the changing climate, but there are many other factors associated with it. But as far as the larger region of uh, Jammu and Kashmir region is concerned, most of the smaller glaciers, what we see using satellite images, no, by smaller glaciers, I mean to say glaciers covering an area of something like 10 hectares, 20 hectares or so. So they, they, have, they have kind of vanished or are at the highest risk as far as disappearance of these glaciers are concerned. Mohammed Ayub Katana is a nomadic herder wandering with his tribe in search of good pastures for their cattle. Having observed the peaks and valleys of the region closely, Katana says he's seen glaciers almost disappear before his eyes. For 10 years, we have been witnessing the decrease in snow and water levels in streams. In the old days, the stream used to be covered under thick snow, starting from the glacier. Now, it's not like before. The stream used to be so deep that one could barely cross it. Now the water has receded and the snow has also disappeared. Well, experts say Kashmir Valley's biggest glacier, Kolhoi, which feeds two major tributaries of the river Jhelum, is also receding at an alarming rate, about a quarter since 1962. It is very concerning for any Himalayan state, but for, for, for Jammu and Kashmir region, it is very concerning given the fact that every sector of economy, be it the agriculture because it is an agrarian economy, be it the hydropower which people boast of that it will take us out of the economic mess we are into. And then the tourism, all these sectors are directly dependent on the water that, that comes out from these snow and glacier resources we have. So any change in the snow and glacier resources is going to have a direct bearing on the agriculture, hydropower and tourism sectors and many other indirect sectors which are, which are, many other sectors which are indirectly dependent on, on water related things. 
Well, in less than a month, world leaders will gather in Glasgow for the upcoming UN climate conference with the hope that they will agree on new commitments to keeping global warming below two degrees in order to help vulnerable communities like these in Kashmir. Now to Los Angeles now, a bit of Hollywood glamour for you before we go tonight. James Bond actor Daniel Craig has been honoured with his very own star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. We can see him uh, here with his co-star Rami Malek and uh, producers Michael G. Wilson and Barbara Broccoli. He was uh, happily watching the unveiling of his new plaque before poking fun at the industry in his speech. I, I never thought I'd hear myself saying this, but, you know, it's an absolute honour to be walked all over in Hollywood. <laughs> Well, the outgoing 007 star has joined the uh, illustrious names on the world-famous tourist attraction. He's not far from his fellow Bond actor, Sir Roger Moore. Well, Craig's star was unveiled at 7007 Hollywood Boulevard, a nod to the spy's nickname. He was there with his supervillain co-star, Rami Malek, who spoke of his absolute delight in starring opposite Daniel Craig. Yeah, we all know he's a superb actor and he's dedicated and he could handle all of his own stunts with one hand tied behind his back and the other holding a Negroni. But he's as fastidious about his craft as he is about his empathy for everyone around him. Well, the latest film in the franchise, No Time to Die, has been praised as a fitting end for Craig's run as 007. The film won critical praise and earned the highest opening weekend takings of any Bond movie in the UK. And, and if, if, if happiness was measured by the company we keep, then me being on this pavement, surrounded by all of these legends, makes me a very, very, very happy man. So thank you very much. That's all from the world this week with me, Tanya Francis. We'll see you at 7 next Saturday as we round up the biggest international stories for a global city.